Jonah chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, uh, it's going to be simple because you can leave here having memorized the entire text that we're going to talk about today. It's a phrase, okay? It's, just, it's the last phrase of verse 9 of chapter 2, but let's hold our water. We'll get there in a minute, okay? Um, I have to recognize um, there's a possibility we are in this um, very short story narrative about a reluctant prophet named Jonah. And being Mother's Day and every typical Sunday, we have people who visit us, and I'm really glad that you're here, but there's a possibility, maybe small, um, but you don't know the, the story of Jonah, or you haven't been caught up in it, so I want to just take a brief, maybe four minutes, five minutes, and I'm going to rush through the narrative that we've been through so far so we can be caught up to know where this phrase shows up in our story. Um, most people, when they hear the name Jonah, they, they probably immediately connect it to a fish, and there's a fish involved, but it isn't the point of the story. So here, here's the story. God calls a prophet named Jonah to go to the Assyrian capital, Nineveh, to tell them one simple message. It's not a good message. It's just destruction's coming. You, you don't want to be that prophet, but that's his job. Um, but the story tells us that Jonah wanted no part of that uh, command, so he got, gets on a boat and he sails the opposite direction of Nineveh. He, wants to, he thinks he's going away from God and God's command. He's just on, on his own trying to get away from God. Okay. Now, here, here's some of the background that you need to know. The place that he's called to is a place called Nineveh. It's the capital of the Assyrians. <clears throat> it's a huge, huge city. Uh, this text tells us it's a three-day walk to get across uh, the, the breadth of this city. 100-foot-tall walls, 50, 40 feet wide. They could do chariot races around them. It's a pretty, a pretty um, amazing place. But it's also a very brutal, brutal city, brutal people. Just to get you in context of why uh, Jonah might be a little anxious about going there, uh, Nineveh and the people of Assyria had a horrible reputation. Uh, they, would, they would kill people just for fun. Uh, when they tortured people, they'd bury them up to their neck. They invented this, bury them up their neck, and they would take their tongues and stake them out in front of them and just let them bake to death. And it was said that most men would just go insane, lose their minds before they would die. And that makes sense. When they took over uh, cities, <clears throat> they would come in hordes, just huge hordes of people. And they were so terrifying what they would do to people that it was said that many towns would just commit mass suicide as opposed to being under the sword of the Assyrians. And when they would take a nation or come after a people, they would always kill the children and always kill the men. And you know what they did with the women. And that was kind of the reputation of Nineveh. So that is the place that God said, Jonah, go tell them they're a wicked city. They'll get it. Um, now, some that I read uh, this week suggested that the Assyrians um, had come against Jonah's hometown, Gath Heifer. And uh, I don't know how accurate that is, but let's just imagine it just for kicks and giggles for a second that the Assyrians had actually attacked Jonah's hometown. There's a possibility that Jonah's own family, he saw his family go through some of the same things, possible Murder, possible rape. So for Jonah, the command is way more than just, I don't like those people from afar. This could be very personal for Jonah. Right? This, this could be my offense. This could be my pain and suffering. And you want me to go to those people who have wounded me and be kind? Now, everyone in here automatically can relate to that story. How to go and be kind to the people who are the unkind to us. Nevertheless, God tells him to go. Jonah refuses to go. He goes the other way. He gets on a boat. God causes a great storm to come into the sea where the boat is. Jonah's under the deck. He's sleeping. The sailors of the boat are trying to figure out how to navigate this storm. They're freaking out. They're praying to their gods. They're asking one another, who's responsible for this? Um, and they even roll the dice to try to figure out who is responsible for this. Finally, they wake up Jonah. And Jonah says, it's me. I'm, I'm the reason why there's a storm here. And he suggests to them the answer, throw me overboard and it'll go calm. And they try to row their way through it and he says, no, just do it. And they do. They throw him over and the seas are calm. The end of chapter one ends with a great fish swallowing Jonah, of which he stays in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. That's the story. That's the narrative that we have studied so far. And if all we had was chapter one of Jonah we would know that Jonah's running from God because he hates the assignment. Or better said, he hates the people of the assignment. He just hates the Ninevites. Uh, I, this is a, maybe a little bit of uh, premature, but there's more to the story than just his hatred of a people. Chapter 4 tells us that Jonah ran for another reason. It's because he knew God. And the text tells us that he knew God was gracious and he's merciful. And he, ha he has a tendency to be that kind. 
And he wanted no part of God being kind to the Ninevites. And so he was reluctant for that kind of grace, that kind of mercy. And again, there's an illustration there for us. There are people groups in our life where we think they don't deserve that kind of grace or the mercy of God. They deserve something else. And yet God is gracious and merciful to whom he wants. That's part of the story that we're going to get today. But that's a little bit premature, as I said. But here we in chapter 2 find a prayer It's a simple prayer of of Jonah while he's in the belly of the fish. And you'll see that it is a conclusion for Jonah on a couple of things. One is his faith that he knows God's not done. Verse 4 tells us pretty clear of chapter 2. Then I said, I am driven away from the sight, yet I shall look again on your holy temple. There was something that Jonah knew or felt, experienced about God, that God, I understand this fish thing isn't the end. I understand there's a future. I understand I will yet again look. So he's expressing faith in what God is doing even in this dark moment for him. And then verse 9 of chapter 2, he expresses this thing called repentance. And just so you know, repentance is a word that just simply means about face. It's a military term. You're marching one way, you turn, you repent, and you march the other way. And Jonah is marching away from obedience to God. Here in this passage, he concludes that he can't run away from God, so he's turning and he's going back to God and he says it this way, but I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. This is, this is Jonah's recognition that I'm coming around, God. I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to go the right way. And then he finishes verse 9 with what I consider to be five words that synthesize the entire subject matter of Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible. He simply says salvation belongs to the Lord. There you have it. From Genesis to Revelation, it is a rescue story, a saving story about a saving God. Jonah knows it from a perspective, and he says it. It's like a fulcrum point in the middle of the, of the scriptures to point again to his saving ways. In fact, it's the exact same phrasing almost to the word that John writes about at the end of the age when the church gathers, the resurrected church gathers to worship the Lord. He says, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. That's the church. That's people who follow Jesus. From every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb who is Christ, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That story rings over and over and over and over again in the scriptures, and it is a magnificent truth, so great In fact, we can't just run past it today. So we're going to set down roots today, and we're going to talk about five words, okay? Um, So in specifics, I'll say it this way. I, I feel it's important for us to put anchors in, to put footings in, theological footings in for the church. Now, I know when I say that word, some of you go, great, theology, hoo hoo. And then some of you don't even know what that is really, but just to keep it in its simplest form, theology is simply everything that's true about God and what God does. That's what theology is. And I don't think anybody is a perfect one. Everyone's just kind of learning as God reveals to them in the scriptures, but we want to know what God wants us to know and what God has revealed about himself in the scriptures. This seems to be a pretty huge statement, isn't it? Salvation belongs to the Lord. And so I think we need to stop for a moment and get our heads around that. Now, let me deal with the skeptic. There's a possibility you hear that we're going to talk about theology and you went, on Mother's Day, can't we do something cute? Can't can't we do something else? Let me just say to you who we consider theology boring, I understand. I understand. I'm sympathetic, okay? Um, There are some of you who might consider this to be a, a subject to be dealt with professional theologians. Theology needs to be with theologians who work at it full-time, like medicine should be in doctor's hands, this isn't for us. And some of you would just be, you're the pragmatics. You come to church to leave with something. You want to do something, you want to become something, so you're taking notes so you can go and practice. And so you look at theology and go, where does that fit? It has no, no, no helpful context for my life. And let me just suggest to you, um, I'm going to get to the reasons why it matters in a little bit. But I will tell you before we even start that everyone in here, I don't care where you are with Jesus or where you are with God, everyone in here cares about theology. In fact, I would say it this way. Everyone here is a theologian. Now, that might be a surprise to you, but let me explain it. If you're a Christian, 
If your own confession is that you know who Jesus is and you confess him as your Lord and Savior, by faith you believe and you repent of your sin. If you're a Christian, then at least at some level you have considered the nature of God and salvation. If all you know of him is um, something simple as Jesus loves me, this I know. If all you know is the nursery rhymes of faith, at least it's your confession, it's some theology, even if it's small. And to those of you who don't know Christ by your own confession, you know him maybe as a historical figure, maybe a good guy, a prophet. He meant well, uh, but he's long gone. He's dead and long gone. To you, I think you're a theologian as well because you think about God even if all you do is think about him long enough to deny him. It's still thoughts of God. And everyone dies with a considered, concluded thought of God. You either will end your life going, I believe, I believe in the narrative, I believe in the text, I believe what God has revealed about himself, or you can say, I have considered the thought of God and I have just disconsidered it. I don't even count it anymore. So at some point, we're all little t theologians. We've decided something about God and believe that we're right about it, right? So that's why I think you're gonna be interested in this. But I think there's a greater question to ask. If you truly are, as I think you are, a theologian, then the question to deal with isn't whether you are or not. The question is if you're right. You need to ask the question, are you right? If whatever things you think about God, are they accurate? Because if you're wrong, it's just a matter of the stakes you're playing. If you're wrong about God, everything could be up for grabs. If you're a Christian and you're wrong, you're wasting your time. If you're an unbeliever and you're wrong, you're wasting your life. So... Um, I think that's why we need to lean into it today. Um, So that's why we want to hit the pause button on these five words. Let's get after it. Verse 9 simply says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Now, just a little cautionary thought. I'm going to quote a ton of scriptures, and uh, I'm not going to put them up on the... uh, on the PowerPoint, because I don't want you distracted. I want you listening. Um, if you want them later, I'll give them to you, but I, I thought we'd be just hitting slides nonstop. So I just want us to lean into these things. L- let's do this. I'm going to break this down in two things, what it means and its implications. First thing, what does it mean that salvation belongs to our God? First thing, salvation is God's property. That's what it means. Most of the time when we think about salvation, we think of it in a self-centered way. After all, I'm the one who gets saved. I'm the one who needs saving, right? That's how we would look at those things. Um, It's mine because I went after it. It's mine because I have it. It's my confession. We use the personal pronouns to describe it, and we confuse that reality with thinking it's about us or that it's our salvation. And let me just suggest to you, it isn't. Like, everything in this world isn't yours as much as you might think it is. In fact, David said in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Everything you see, everything you can touch belongs to God. That's what David says. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, the writer tells us that the Lord, to the Lord your God belong the heavens, the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. So just like everything in the earth and in the heavens and you and me belong to the Lord, here's what the scriptures teach us. Salvation also belongs to the Lord. David prayed in Psalm 51 when he's talking about his sin in view of his sin, in view of God's ability to forgive, he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Now most of the time when that passage is quoted, we put my in there, like it belongs to me. It's kind of a a little slip of the tongue, I think. But the bottom line is that David saw salvation as God's, not mine. I receive it, yes, but it's his. If you trust in Christ alone, yes, salvation is granted to you, but it belongs to him. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing about what it means. Salvation is his identity. There's a a, a similar passage in Revelation chapter seven. I don't have time to read it, but the phrase is almost word for word exactly what Jonah prays. Salvation belongs to our God, personal pronoun, our God. So let me just unpack that for us a little bit. In other words, salvation is the exclusive property to our God, a specific God, one God, one exclusive God. Not not another God, not an option God, not a mini option God. He's one God. He's the God of the New Testament and the Old Testament. He's the only God who truly is. Salvation belongs to him. And here's the the confrontation of this thing. A lot of people put their hope in salvation in other options. But there aren't other options. They're on other gods, they're on other ways. There's only one. It's exclusive because he alone saves. 
It's because it's who he is. Our God is a saving God. You can pick this story up, and you can start in the beginning, and you can work through, and I dare you, if you just sat down and wrote down every time you see God saved, you'd be overwhelmed with that being the constant drip of the story. Just for fun, let's go through some of them. Exodus 12, he saved Israel from Pharaoh, didn't he? He saved David from the hand of the king. He saved Daniel from the lion's mouth. He saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire and the flames. He saved the blind man and the crippled man who couldn't walk, was born that way. He saved the ostracized prostitute in John chapter 4. He saved doubting Thomas. He saved denying Peter. And somewhere on the road to Damascus when Paul didn't have a clue and his name was Saul and he's fighting against Jesus, God woke him up too. Over and over and over and over and over again, he shows himself as a savior. It's his name. It's his identity. David says in Psalm 68, verse 20, our God is a God of salvation. Now, if you've been around redemption very long, you know that every week we try to come back to the good news. The good news is the gospel. The good news is how God and why God saves people. And there's aspects of salvation we try to lean into uh, from time to time, if not in total. And that is there's a past version of salvation, there's a current version of salvation, and there's a future version of salvation. The past version is when you pick up your Bible and you read about how God rescues sinners who've made a mess of their life and everyone else. And he says, as far as the east is from the west, so far I've removed your transgressions from you. The guilty charge is gone. That past true event that makes you holy before God did happen, is true and right. Amen? Okay, well, there is also a present salvation that is taking place. It's transformation. It is a rescue of my current situation. God is making me like Christ, saving me now from the way I used to be and the way I tend to be in my flesh. And there's a future salvation, and that is when God deals with this flesh perfectly and permanently at the resurrection, and I am made brand new with no inclinations for sin anymore. I'm made like Christ. That is a future hope. Amen? So you see the orb, the full orbed version of salvation, past, present, and future. And all of that story has as its very center, at its very center is God, the verb and the noun. He is the actor and the action of salvation. It's all his. It's his identity. And in spite of what you may have heard, even in spite of, and I'm not trying to be offensive, in spite of what you may truly believe, salvation isn't up to you. Salvation isn't a God-man cooperation. It's not like you come to your senses on your own without help and God kind of comes to some kind of conclusions on you and you meet somewhere in a prayer meeting and you go, hey, you agree to me, I agree to you, like a marriage. That ain't the way it works. That's not how it happens. You don't initiate it, you don't achieve it, you don't work for it, and you don't earn it. He owns it. It's his identity. He is the savior. We're the recipient. Okay, we need help understanding even more of that, what I just said to you. So let's do this. Let's talk for a second about what salvation is as, as God is the owner. What does that look like? If it's truly his property and if it's truly his identity, how do we experience it? What are the particulars? I, I missed the preaching collective the week that we did this. I was driving to Las Vegas for the day. But every week we do the preaching collective, there's a whiteboard we write notes on and they take a picture of it and they post it on some I don't know, social media thingamajiggy. And I read that picture. And on that picture were six statements, declarations about salvation and God's role in it. And I thought, we're just going to use that. So that's what this is, the next six phrases. Here's the first one. The first truth about salvation, salvation is that it's initiated by God's grace and God's grace alone. Grace, if you're not aware, is unearned favor. It is just simply giving you what you don't deserve. The blessing kind. Giving you grace, this unearned favor. Here's how Paul says it in Ephesians 2. It is by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that nobody can boast. Do you understand? Not of yourselves, not of works, from God. Grace, okay? Grace is what's about to happen to Nineveh, as we'll read in chapter 3. Grace is what happened to anybody in here who raises your hand when I say, do you trust Christ? Because grace happened to you. Romans 3 tells us that no one understands. In our sinful flesh, if God doesn't do something about it, that no one understands God and no one seeks God. No one. 
there isn't any kind of kernel of interest in your heart, exclusive of God changing how your heart thinks that will just go pursuing him. No man knows and no man seeks and no man cares apart from God's work in our life. It's God's grace that seeks us out. That's grace. Okay, and, and we don't have time to do this, but it'd be very interesting for you to stare at that truth when you realize that grace comes in spite of your rebellion. And I don't have to tell you how big that is. If we just confess our corporate rebellion, this is what we all do. This is who we all are. We would feel guilty enough. But if I said, now let's put your private stuff online. Let's take your entire story, everything you do and every reason why you do it, and then consider how God, in spite of you, could give you what you don't deserve. Well, that's, that's when you start to tap out. That's when you say thank you. That's when you cry because you don't deserve it. That's grace. You deserve the opposite. Let me give you the second aspect of salvation. Salvation is achieved by God's power. Romans 1, Paul tells us, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to anyone and everyone who believes. It's the power of God. He also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it's the power of God to those who are being saved. It's God's power. It's achieved by God's power. It's the power of God who takes that stubborn, petrified, hard, unresponsive heart and exchange it for a heart that says, I feel conviction. I feel I need. It's a heart that says, I, I love. That, that heart, God, God in his power transplants for us. He opens blind eyes. Eyes at one point who thought the whole thing about Jesus and the gospel is a joke and something to laugh at and to mock to something that moves me deeply that I have to have. He opens the blind eyes. He converts the soul from death to life. It's the power of God who whispers in the ears of his children and says, wake up. And every one of us do. And you can't resist him. That's power. Amen? Third thing, salvation is offered on God's terms. In other words, brace yourself. He gives it to whomever he wants. Romans 9, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. In other words, he saves who he wants, he saves how he wants, and he saves when he wants. It is his. It's offered on his terms. Here's the fourth thing. Salvation is accomplished by God's son. Acts chapter four, perhaps you're familiar Salvation exists in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved. No other name. No other option. Listen to me. Just listen to me. I don't care where you came from today. I don't care if this is your first time landing in redemption. I'm telling you life words. Whatever else it is you're chasing other than Jesus only equals death. There is no other name by which men must be saved. It's Jesus or nothing. It's exclusive. Christ alone, he said of himself, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life and there is no other way. John 3, this is the verse after the one everyone knows, okay? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Why did Jesus come? To save us. Salvation is accomplished by his son. Here's the fifth thing. Salvation is secured by God's promises. Salvation is secured by God's promises. There's a word that the scripture uses, another word for promise. It's called covenant. And throughout the entire text, the covenants of God just come and they come and they come. Promises that God makes and promises that God delivers on. In fact, I would just tell you, you already know this. Promises are only good as the person who makes them and their ability to fulfill them, right? And so God makes promises. He made many promises. Let me remind you of a few. To Noah, he said, no, you're not going to perish. I'll redeem you from the flood. I will save your life. You don't have to worry. To Abraham, who had no children, who lamented being an old man without any hope, he said, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. Not only will you have a child, an entire people group will find their lineage through you. To Moses, he said, listen, I will deliver you. You won't be enslaved forever. And you, you will be my people, and I will be your God, and that's my covenant to you, and it will last forever. That's my promise. 
to David. He said, this throne that you're going to be established on will happen to be a throne that lasts forever and ever and ever because from you will come the Savior and the Savior will sit on an everlasting throne. That's my promise. When Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room, right before he was to suffer, he held up the cup of wine and said, this represents the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant is a covenant of grace. Grace alone. All this religion that you think is like automatic in your mind, like, God, I'll fix it. I'll be better. I'll go to church. I'll pray. He knows you won't. And it won't merit holiness anyway. So he simply says, you come to me and I'll give you everything you need. And I'll hold it for you. Grace. It's a promise he made. All of his promises point to a God who is a saving God. Let me give you one last thought. Salvation is guaranteed by God's sovereignty. I, um, I'm going to read this. I was doubting, doubting whether I would, but I'm going to read this. Here's what I want you to do. Listen. Don't write, listen. And even if you're struggling and at war with what I'm saying right now, listen. Because what you're going to hear in this, and I'm going to try to emphasize these phrases, is the absolute ownership of everything God does for people who come to him. It is his salvation. Watch this, and I'll try to emphasize it. We've been through this in the past, I don't know, last year at least. Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in, in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ. Do you have any questions on who's doing what here? It's interesting to me that people can read this and gloss over God in this whole thing because they keep thinking about themselves as a target. You're simply the recipient of the amazing love and grace of God so that all praise and glory goes to him, not to you. We get it backwards. We get it upside down. And that's why we can look at this story of our life, even of our struggle, and say honestly, with full conviction, our salvation isn't in question ever. It doesn't depend on us. Our salvation doesn't have our, it, its beginning or its ending in us. Salvation isn't God's pleasure in you. It's God's pleasure in his son for you. That's what salvation is. You didn't earn it. You cannot lose it. And I just gave you a mouthful. So for those of you who are going, now when is this going to get practical? Like, Tim, tell me how I'm going to leave here with something. Let me give you some stuff of why it matters. Here's the first thing. Because without sound doctrine, without looking at this and owning this and knowing this, you, you, will, you will always have a deficient love. Matthew 22, Jesus said, here's the greatest commandment. You do this, you win. Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You cannot love him, heart, soul, mind, and strength unless you know him. Do you want to just obey the first commandment? You got to know him. Who, who in your life do you love without knowing? It doesn't work that way. Uh, 1982. So that's a long time ago. I don't even want to do the math. I saw my wife. She wasn't my wife. She was a girl that I didn't know walking across the parking lot at the college I went to. Now, what if I just simply spent the rest of my life admiring from a distance Suzanne? I would not have a wife. I would not know Suzanne. There would not be a thing called love. You can't see. Most people choose to admire God from a distance. Like, isn't he lovely? Statement. Isn't he nice? Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he cute? Isn't he friendly and safe? But he's not those things. You don't know those things because you're staying at a distance. You can't love him unless you know him, and you've got to know him by getting close. That's how this thing works. We are commanded in the scriptures to worship God in spirit and in truth, and you can't do that. The deeper we grow uh, in knowing him, that's the theology part. That's the word nobody wants to wrestle with. But the deeper you get to know him, theology, the more you get to love him, worship. And you can't skip one to get to the other. Make sense? 
Let me give you a second reason why this matters, why theology should matter to you, and why this phrase, salvation belongs to the Lord, matters. Because sound theology, um, without it, will lead to a deficient walk. Not only a deficient love, but a deficient walk. Paul told Titus, knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. What we know about God and his commands always, and what we don't know, I should say, always leads to sinful choices. I mean, I didn't know. I, I had no idea that that's the way I was supposed to live. And I would tell you this, that the, there's a sanctifying work that doctrine does in our life, and, and, it, and it does it from the very beginning. When the doctrine, the simple doctrine of you're a sinner and Jesus is a savior happens, when God allows it to happen in your heart, the first thing you feel is conviction. And conviction is the warning system from God to turn from the sin that brings the conviction. That's the first blush in your converted life. And everywhere else in your life, every moment of your life, for the rest of your life, God is doing that same sanctifying work. And as you get to know him, guess what happens? Sensitivity and conviction gets more intense. It gets more sensitive. Like it really works. And, and as opposed to just seeing big glaring sins, you start to see motives behind the sins and you start catching more things and you become more and more like Jesus. Make sense? Let me give you one last reason why this theology should matter to you. Because without it, you'll have a deficient hope. M most people um, choose to relate to God based on feelings. So if you have a great day, great week, great month, great year, God is so good. God is so, he's so good. Hey, you should know my God because he's, he's a good God. Until you don't have a good day or a good week or a good year. And something gets turned around. Somebody fails you or somebody leaves you or something falls apart. And God doesn't seem to be so good that day or that year. And we would rather relate to him on feelings. And let me just tell you something you already know. Feelings lie to you. Feelings always fade. But here's the best part about it. Feelings can't save you. They're not a savior. They can't, they can't hold you up in the midst of trouble. We, we sang the song, I, I will praise you on the mountain. And when that mountain is right here, feelings don't get you past that. They have no ability to help. I'm glad we get them once in a while. Trust me. But the reason why we need theology is because we need an anchor. Anchors don't move when the wind blows. Anchors aren't conditional, and they are not temporary. What we know about God and his ways allows us to spot the lies of the adversary when he tries to tell us that God's not going to do what he promised to do. And it's what allows us to stand in the midst of trouble. And, and I don't have to tell you, trouble is coming. It comes to all of us. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 said this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. You tell me, church, what is the unseen in this story? God. We fix our eyes on him, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Here's what we need to know today. Here's what I want you to know today. Here's what I want you to leave with today. Salvation belongs to our God. Amen? Let's pray together. God, help us. Help us understand this. Help us to remember this. God, sink this truth deep within us so that uh, when the trouble comes, we won't fade. We won't be ruined. Um, God, there's some of us who have such a superficial relationship with Jesus and we need more because more of you is, is better for us. And so God, help us worship you in spirit and in truth. Um, God, we praise you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.